Thanks, Paul, and also thanks, Michael, for inviting me to come and speak today. And also for, um, you know, it was a, a nice honor to be invited to the Ed Board as well. It was, uh, I was very impressed uh, with the BCNI and the, the program that you have set forth and the, the goals that you're planning in the future. So I think uh, Michael had invited me to come and, and speak uh, a little bit about our experience in, in Finland, uh, doing something uh, very similar, especially with the biobanking. Uh, and preclinical work in, in hematology. And uh, Michael and I had met a, a couple years ago at a, at a meeting in Munich, and I was explaining our national biobank. And uh, this is, I think, now progressed because Finland is, is about the same size as, as Ireland. It's 5.5 million people. There are five uh, university hospitals and, and about 25 different regional centers as well. And it really sort of, you know, made sense to try to collaborate and consolidate our efforts, especially in rare diseases. So uh, we got involved at the Institute for Molecular Medicine in Finland. And this is based in Helsinki on the medical campus there, uh, because uh, FIM has uh, a history of biobanking, of, of genome research. Uh, we're located very close uh, to the medical, main medical center here, and this, is, uh, and this building is our hematology clinic. And at FIM, uh, we have the infrastructure for biobanking and also genome research. So it's, it's not a big institute. It was established in uh, about 2009, so not too long ago. And based on uh, this biobank collection and uh, also molecular precision medicine, it was also a, a partner of the EMBL. So in the Nordics, uh, each of the, the countries, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and, and Finland, have these molecular medicine institutes, and we each have a theme. So FIM is molecular medicine, but uh, genome biology, and also uh, precision uh, cancer medicine. And since it's, it's a, a relatively new institute, the groups there were quite young and also very motivated. Uh, it was, uh, they started off quite small. Uh, we, we had very good uh, leadership by Oli Kalyanemi. And uh, we decided to start off also by collaborating with uh, Grand Challenge projects. And this was on human genomics, uh, also uh, digital pathology and imaging, and also systems medicine approach uh, for cancer. And uh, this was complemented by a very nice infrastructure uh, in our institute. So very good expertise and a uh, next-gen core sequencing facility, very good bioinformatics team, and also a high-throughput uh, uh, screening unit. And this unit was sort of interesting because it was set up as a functional genomics unit to do uh, genome-wide RNAi screening, but I'm going to show you in my presentation how this has really been repurposed for pre precision uh, medicine strategies. And then also with the imaging and uh, uh, informatics looking for new biomarkers for response. And in our cellar, we also house uh, national uh, biobank collections and also new disease-specific collections, including our Finnish hematology registry and biobank. So I think uh, when we take it, I know that, that Don was sort of skeptical now about the, the genome approach to, to cancer treatment, but uh, this has been actually, um, I think, exemplified by a few different diseases now. Uh, CML, I think, is the hallmark disease, or you have the BCR able translocation, and where Gleevec or Imatinib has been shown to be a very effective drug for this disease. And this has been followed up by an another, a number of other diseases as well, and a number of different targeted therapies, or at least sort of targeted therapies. Dirty kinase inhibitors sometimes do work. And, uh, but also I think um, with our increasing uh, knowledge and our capabilities and technology, we're also getting a huge amount of data uh, from our study. So for each patient, we can get their mutation profile, we can get their transcriptome 
transcriptome profile and, and several other uh, types of omic uh, data. And, and it's going to be quite a challenge in, on how we process this data. So instead of, uh, we're, we're taking a, a more precision approach, but we also need a very systematic approach as well. So this was the idea between our, or behind our grand challenge project for uh, systems medicine to optimize treatment uh, for cancer patients uh, based on uh, drug response profiling and also other omic analyses. We started this in 2010. Uh, this was complemented with the initiation and, and the drive uh, by the head of hematology in Helsinki, Kimo Korka, um, to set up a national biobank as well. And uh, the idea behind that is also similar to, to what the BCNI ha have in terms of collecting a very high quality set of samples from patients at different stages of their disease, so at diagnosis, uh, at treatment response, relapse and resistance. Since we also have the capabilities at, at our institute, we were very interested in applying these to, to this set of samples. So high throughput ex vivo drug testing and also uh, next gen sequence analysis. And what was also very important for us is that we would be able to feed that information back to the treating doctors and also uh, if they could use that data uh, for uh, treat new treatment options, especially for, for relapsed uh, AML patients or relapsed myeloma patients. And at the same time, we could use the, the information that we are getting from the functional drug testing assay and also the next-gen sequence analysis to really get a better idea of uh, the pathogenesis of, of the disease and also drug resistance mechanisms. So I'll talk to you a little bit now about our experience with our National Biobank uh, effort. And uh, basically, it has taken several years to, to get started. The paperwork and the groundwork was initiated in 2010. We actually, even though um, the biobanking laws didn't really take place until later, the sample collection was started. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to optimize that. We wanted to get very high quality samples that could be used for functional analysis in the research lab. So this would be cryo viably cryopreserved mononuclear cells uh, uh, that would be isolated from bone marrow aspirates or peripheral blood samples from the patients, and also plasma and serum. And since we're very interested in, in looking at the mutation profile, the somatic mutation profile of these patients, we also would take a skin biopsy sample for germline sequence analysis. Uh, there were, I mentioned that there are five medical universities in, in Finland, and uh, they are sometimes a bit competitive. So. Uh, they only agreed to participate in, in this effort if there was an, another neutral party. And that neutral party was the Finnish Red Cross Blood Service uh, in Finland. And this is an accredited institute that does the stem cell collection for, for transplants and also umbilical cord uh, uh, stem cell collection as well. So they really had the logistics in, in place and the processing in place as well. It was also important that we would make the permits uh, very uh, wide in terms of uh, their apl applicability, sorry, uh, for, for accessibility, for, for samples. Uh, so basically many researchers outside, even outside of Finland would be able to access these samples as well as pharma. Uh, we would like to stipulate that the data that would be generated from, from those samples would uh, actually then be returned to the database so it could be used also for other research studies. So I mentioned that, that this was actually started before the, the Biobank Act in Finland was established. Um, so we have had to make amendments uh, to our, our permissions during that time. But the Biobank Act in Finland was uh, uh, very broad, uh, and it would enable uh, samples to be transported out of Finland, although they would, uh, the samples would be coded and the patients that are supplying these samples would be protected. 
and the permissions had to be uh, made or granted by a, a national authority as well, and uh, the biobank needed to be certified as well. There were, for this national hematology biobank, uh, three different partners in, uh, in the beginning. It was the Finnish Hematology Association, the Finnish Red Cross Blood Service, and the institute that I'm at, FIM. Each had a, a, a special role, so the, of course, the Finnish Hematology Association was the hospital and patient representative, the Red Cross Blood Service, the processing unit, and then FIM provided the infrastructure and IT uh, and database support uh, for the effort. There is a steering group that uh, is composed of, of one representative from each of these partners, but then there is also a representative from the patient adv advocacy group. And then to apply for samples, there is a scientific ad board, and uh, they, it is their responsibility to review any applica applications for these samples. And then, especially in the beginning, what was needed was a, an operative group, and, and this was uh, comprised of, of different uh, people with different expertise, maybe in sample handling, processing, IT support, just to get this off the ground, also uh, on the clinical side as well. So uh, we've discussed, uh, we had at least one or two meetings a month just trying to, to optimize uh, the collection, uh, the processing, transportation, and the, the IT, etc. And uh, this has now, since this is now working, uh, the operational group doesn't have to, to meet so often, but, but it was, I think, needed uh, to, to get this going. The way that this is paid for uh, is actually through the healthcare system. The, the hospitals are the different partners in this effort agreed that um, biobanking should be part of routine patient care. Therefore, the hospitals agreed to actually pay for the sampling, which includes the data registry, sampling, the processing, biobanking, or storage. And this is actually quite small compared to other lab tests uh, that the patients would undergo. So uh, uh, 453 euros during Monday through Thursday, a little bit extra for the time spent to process a sample on a Friday afternoon. But it was considered to be part of good clinical practice. And it has taken quite a, a bit of time also to sort of instill the culture of, of sampling for the biobank uh, in the clinics and also getting the, the data at the same time uh, into the registry. But I think it, it's become much more routine. And in our collection, we, as I mentioned, we do have serum, we have uh, plasma. Uh, we also collect the viably cryopreserved mononuclear cells. Uh, we decided to take all comers, uh, but of course in the clinic they have some special interests, so the AML patients were in, in greatest need and that collection grew uh, quickly uh, and then after that multiple myeloma. But basically we, we take all samples from all patients. And then at FIM, we have a very nice centralized storage facility uh, for these samples and for the other uh, national biobanking efforts or even local biobanking efforts uh, with very good uh, uh, support in terms of automated liquid nitrogen fill-ups and very good trained personnel, very good capacity. And two times a year, we, for the, the FHRB, we do check the viability of our, our cryopreserved cells just to make sure that the quality is maintained. We also check the, the RNA integrity and DNA integrity as well. And then you can just see, this is uh, a little dated, uh, uh, this table, but you know, for, for, for AML, we do take samples, uh, diagnosis, and, and remission, and, and relapse. Uh, you can see uh, from these numbers the number of patients, and, and then maybe the, the number, of, this is the number of tubes of mononuclear cells uh, that we have uh, for, for AML, and then also the other types of samples that we have. 
And then with our registry information that's connected up to the biobank information, we can start breaking down the subtypes of, of AML patients. So if one is interested in looking at a specific subtype of AML, you can go into uh, this, uh, this table or, uh, uh, or this database and, and start looking for, for the, the type of AML samples that you're, you're most interested in. And in the beginning, we, we had a, a very big ambition to be able to uh, do sequence analysis uh, of all of these samples, uh, from first for, from AML patients. Um, we started off doing exome sequence analysis, which is uh, you know, rather expensive because you have to sequence both the tumor sample and uh, the normal uh, DNA sample, which is, in our case, mostly skin biopsy DNA and also RNA-seq information. This gives us a huge amount of information of uh, SNVs and also copy number variants for the patients, uh, structural rearrangements um, that we can see that are expressed through the, uh, through uh, expressed gene fusions, and also gene expression uh, information from, from the RNA-seq. Of course, there are many other uh, analyses that could be done as well. Uh, but, of course, this, this is quite expensive, and, and uh, we have managed to sequence, uh, I think, a majority of the AML patients, that, that, uh, samples that we have collected, but this has been due to an effort to um, consolidate our, our funding and have joint uh, uh, grant applications uh, to be able to do this analysis. And then on the, the functional drug testing assay side, uh, while we were, were developing the, the collection and, and also the different platforms, the high throughput unit at FIM was also developing their, their uh, drug sensitivity assay, mainly for oncology. And, and this was a very nice uh, way uh, to set up a large collection of, of uh, small, these are mainly small molecule inhibitors that are mostly approved or investigational, so they were easily accessible through commercial chemical vendors. They contain all of the conventional chemotherapeutics, but also other signal transduction inhibitors. And these drugs are then plated on 384 well plates in five different concentrations. We, we, uh, use what we call an acoustic dispenser. Uh, it's called an echo from a company called LabSite. Uh, so this dispenser actually can shoot the, the drugs onto the 384 well plates in nanoliter quantity, so nobody has to, to pipette the drugs onto those plates. And then we use an, another um, multi-well uh, dispenser that is from uh, Thermo Fisher to, to drop the cells onto the prepared plates. So to, to make this really easy and the, the workflow very straightforward, the drug plates are actually prepared ahead of time and we can store these uh, for at least a month. And then when we get a new patient sample into the lab, the, the drug plates can just be pulled out, the cells added to these plates and the cells incubated uh, for a three-day period, after which uh, there, uh, another reagent, cell titer glow, is added to the plates, and the viability red. And because we, we've tested the, we're testing the drugs in five different concentrations, we can get a very nice dose-response curve for each of the, the drugs and each of those, those samples. So we are, this is sort of a basic viability uh, assay, and it's, it's based on, on metabolism, the amount of ATP that is produced by the, the cells that are remaining in, in the, the wells after the drug treatment. Uh, but we are trying to develop other technologies at our institute as well. We have a high throughput flow cytometer also, uh, high throughput imaging. Uh, it was nice to, to see your facilities yesterday as well. So you have some nice uh, equipment that, that we would also like to have as well. But, uh, and I think that would be very applicable to this type of system. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah, we, we do get hundreds of dose response curves uh, now. Uh, for each drug, and, and, and it's very challenging then to sort of interpret that, that data for the clinic especially and, and do it in a reasonable amount of time. 
And then we also get the information from exome sequencing uh, and then RNA sequencing. We, we do a, a little bit of proteomic analysis as well. But, you know, how do you get that data interpreted and feedback to the clinic, especially with, with AML, where you need that data right away. So basically, the, the drug sensitivity assay takes us about four days, and we have now have uh, automated pipelines to, inter to, to uh, evaluate that data. Uh, exome and RNA sequencing, they take a little longer, actually, about probably less than, than two weeks, but, but again, we have automated pipelines uh, to do the analyses. But it's still very much a challenge. You know, how, how, do, how do you interpret that, that data? And we're finding that uh, there are probably new roles uh, uh, also being established uh, as we develop these technologies, uh, apply them to patient care. And uh, one of the things is, is uh, data and interpretation. So, we get a list of uh, somatic mutations for each patient. Basically, um, some of us spend some time just looking at this list and saying, okay, you know, these are the most important uh, mutations. And, and this is sort of nice that we've, we can fall back on, on other previous large-scale genomic studies like the, the Cancer Genome at Atlas uh, for AML, TCGA. And we can quickly then identify which are the important mutations for each patient. Uh, we do get together, um, so the basic researchers and the clinical team as well, to discuss uh, especially um, challenging uh, patient cases and interpretation of the data. But also, I think we're finding that the patients, as they become much more informed, and, and I think as you heard from, from Jim O'Mel today, that they can also uh, be empowered if they have this information and uh, have some influence and, and knowledge that, that they can contribute uh, to their care as well. And in general, also the, the medical community. So as this large-scale data is, is being produced uh, and made available, I think we'll see uh, much more contribution from, from the sort of non non-medical uh, community as well. So I think uh, we have several questions, I think, when, when we're using this approach, because it, it's quite a broad, broad approach. And, 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 and from a basic science side, it, it's not, you know, you're not looking at one gene or uh, trying to do some very specific analysis. This is, you know, a system-wide approach. You're looking at individual patients. This is also a bit different in terms of how one would, would set up a, a large-scale study, because usually you, you need a lot of patients, large cohort, large number of samples to be able to get statistically meaningful data. So we have sort of a, a different approach using a systems-wide uh, application for, for individual patients, and, and is this really beneficial, and does it benefit the patient, and uh, how can we use the infrastructure uh, uh, more, uh, more easily uh, for their benefit? And, but at the same time, as basic researchers, how can we benefit from this approach as well, uh, especially with heterogeneous patient populations and samples? And then, uh, how is the clinic at the same time benefiting uh, in terms of uh, are they finding new ideas in, in treating their patients and is it useful uh, for, for them? And, you know, how can you sort of bridge that gap between the basic research side and, and also the clinical side and, and really make translational research feasible? So I'm going to now show you a few examples in hematology uh, of of our experience. Uh, first of all, we, we started off with, with AML, and um, I won't go into the survival, why we were studying this disease. I, I, think, I think we got that uh, introduction from Alan this morning, but yeah, that the survival rate is still quite poor, uh, and uh, treatment really hasn't changed in the past 30 years. Uh, for for AML, it, we just use the mononuclear cell fraction from these uh, bone marrow or blood samples that are collected from these patients, add them th to these 
these drug plates uh, that we have set up. And then after, um, after going through the automated data pipeline, uh, what we can do is we can start ranking the drug responses. So uh, Tero Aitokalia, who's a, a computational biologist at our institute and his group developed what we call a, a drug sensitivity score. And this is based on, on the dose response curve and also the slope of, of the curve. So the higher the, the DSS value, uh, the greater the sensitivity of the patient cells to that particular drug. We also screen healthy bone marrow cells as well, and so we can do a comparison uh, between the DSS value of the, the patient sample to the DSS value of the healthy control, and we can get what we call a selective DSS score. And so the higher the selective DSS score, the better the select sensitivity. So this is, these are drugs that are mainly target, targeting the, the, the tumor cells uh, compared to uh, the response to, to non-tumor cells. And, and therefore, we use this, this score to, to rank the drugs, and we can provide these waterfall plots so that the, uh, on the clinical side, they can easily look at the, the, the mm -hmm. highest hits. We can, as, as we collect more data from, from the cohort, we can start uh, looking at the responses to different drugs, uh, conventional chemotherapeutics, at the, the AML response, and also at the, the healthy bone marrow response. And we can see, well, cytarabine looks actually quite good for uh, AML. It's pretty specific compared to the, the normals. Uh, but there are other drugs that are, are used for for AML treatment, which also target the healthy control cells as well. And then with the small molecule inhibitors, we're seeing actually a much more selective effect. They're, they're actually better than for um, the AML cells compared to, to the control samples. And we can also start ranking the, the patient uh, samples based on their, their sensitivity. So for the cohort of AML samples, we can see that actually there are several samples that have a very good response to the MEK inhibitor trametinib. Well, if you look at the, the response to idorubicin uh, and anthracycline, you can see that that response is sort of spread out where, where some of the samples don't respond that well, while other samples respond very well. And then if we look at individual patients, uh, yeah, we, we have the, this type of waterfall plot, and we can look at, uh, you know, if there are any drugs that might already be approved for other indications, and that could be uh, repositioned for, in this case, this was an AML patient. And then also, this, didn't, uh, this doesn't show up very well, but we can start grouping the responses. So if we're interested in, in all AML patients that respond very well to desotinib, we can go back to the genome and gene ex expression data of that group of patients and see if there's a very good uh, biomarker for that response. And so we're starting to build up this data. Um, this was published a, a couple of years ago in Cancer Discovery, but we, we will hopefully have a, a larger cohort published uh, maybe a bit later. But what we can do is also uh, generate these, these heat maps of the drug sensitivity. So this is very similar to, to how you would plot gene expression data, but this is actually the drug sensitivity or the select drug sensitivity that is plotted here. So the, the red indicates good select sensitivity, blue indicates poor select sensitivity. So you can start clustering the patients on their overall drug response profile uh, and start uh, grouping them into maybe a more sensitive group to, to more resistant group. And, and if we look at the, the known markers for, for AML, we can see that the FLIP patients with um, FLIP3 mutations actually have very good sensitivity then to broad spectrum kinase inhibitors, also FLIP3 inhibitors, as would be expected. Uh, uh, Patients with an MLL fusion actually had pretty good sensitivity to MEK and PI3 kinase inhibitor sensitivity. So this is starting to give us uh, uh, possible new predictive biomarkers, novel therapeutics, also new ideas for drug combinations. And then if we look at the responses of, of individual patients, um, this was one case 
uh, where uh, a patient was become, became uh, relapsed and was refractory to treatment, uh, to standard induction treatment. We did several samplings and also analyses, and what we found is that uh, the patient had a very nice sensitivity to disotinib, also sunitinib and temsorolimus, and this combination was provided to this patient. And there was a, a nice drop in the blast count and normalization uh, of, the, of, of hematopoiesis as well. Unfortunately, this was uh, probably a, uh, a response that lasted for a couple months, gave the, the patient a little bit more time. But uh, he eventually did relapse. And when we look at the sequence analysis of the, the serial samples, we can see which mutations uh, were responsible for the initiation of the disease, also the mutations that were present at induction uh, chemotherapy, and which also uh, were killed off uh, by that induction treatment, but other uh, clones or other mutations that, that arose uh, during the progression, and also the clones that finally led uh, to this patient's death. Uh, the, in the clinic, they, they do try to use um, the data that we're producing to choose new uh, treatments for especially relapse refractory AML patients. This is uh, uh, the response rate that they have uh, seen so far. This is a bit old, but basically this number is remaining the same. But if they decide to use a treatment based on this ex, ex vivo drug testing, they're starting to see that there is a 40% response rate in relapse refractory AML patients. So this is looking very promising as well. And then switching over to another case example, uh, BCR ABLE, uh, positive CML and ALL. There was one uh, uh, pH plus positive ALL patient uh, who showed a very good sensitivity to several kinase inhibitors, not, not imotinib, but actually there was this drug, uh, excitinib, and also the drug panotinib, which unfortunately wasn't uh, available at that time. Uh, but this was quite curious. So excitinib is actually approved as an uh, inhibitor for, for VGF receptors. Uh, it's uh, made by Pfizer uh, and uh, used for the treatment of relapsed renal cell carcinoma. If we, we looked at the overall responses, we could see a few patients that had very good responses to excitinib. And then uh, working with uh, Pfizer, who had developed this drug, they found that actually uh, the, the activity of excitinib was actually very specific for a specific type of mutation to, to ABLE. So it was this T315I mutation. And uh, it was actually a bit uh, more effective than, than targeting VGFR2. So eventually this was, was published uh, last year and, and led by our, uh, the head of our high throughput unit, Christopher Vanenbelli. But a nice uh, example of how you can reposition drugs uh, to new indications. And then more recently, we also uh, were able to show this for a patient uh, with pre-B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This patient um, had undergone the standard induction treatment uh, for this disease. Uh, we had done the exome sequence analysis and also RNA sequence analysis uh, for uh, several of his samples. And you can see that the mutation, from the mutation profile that this was going to be quite challenging. So the, the translocation uh, of TCF3 and PBX1 between chromosome 1 and 19 is, is relatively rare in, in, in ALL. So in adult patients, about uh, 1 to 2 percent of these patients. It's thought that that response should be pretty good to, to the standard of care, but uh, this patient became quite refractory. And we can see from the relapse samples that uh, the patient had acquired mutations to p53 uh, during progression. And also mutations uh, were present to, to other genes as well, for example, mTOR. And if we looked at the... the um, the overall drug response profile, we did see sensitivity to rapid logs, which should target mTOR. 
and also several other kinase inhibitors as well. So, for example, abrutinib. Um, there was some response to disotinib, and the patient was given disotinib, uh, but there was very little response. And in the ex vivo assay, if we compared the response to a blast crisis CML patient, we could see that the dose response curve was not as, as deep. So there was only a mild response to disotinib. Unfortunately, the, the, we had to look at the, this data retrospectively, and we compared it to uh, the drug sensitivity data that we had from uh, other ALL patients in our cohort, also CML as well. And, and we could see that samples from this patient were exceptionally sensitive uh, to this drug called idealisib. And this has uh, been approved recently for, for CLL. It targets a specific type of uh, PI kinase that is expressed in, in B cells, and, and we could see that this particular patient had, had the cells were, were quite sensitive to this drug. And we have since gone on to show through functional assays that also cell lines that express uh, this particular fusion were also quite sensitive uh, to this drug. There was only one cell line that also had a, a RAS mutation, which showed some resistance. So we're starting to, to put together then the data that showed that maybe idealisib, which was approved for uh, CLL, might be a, a good uh, drug for this particular subtype of, of ALL. And then using our RNA-seq data, we could also see uh, that expression of the target of idealisib was uh, quite high in, in the patient samples. And if we look at CHIP-seq data, chromatin immunoprecipitation data, we could see that both TCF3 and PBX1 were binding to the promoter of that gene. So this gave us more functional uh, evidence that, that idealisib is, is probably a very good drug for this particular group of uh, pre b uh, ALL patients. So we were more or less uh, repositioning a, a drug from CLL to a very small subgroup uh, of ALL patients. And then uh, now just to, to move over to, to myeloma. Myeloma, as, as, as um, both Jim and, and Hank mentioned, is the second most common hematologic malignancy. And, and so we've been able to, to uh, collect uh, a large number of samples in a relatively uh, short amount of time. Uh, the processing, though, is quite more involved. Uh, with, with the leukemias, we usually gen, uh, depend on blast count, and, and we can just isolate the mononuclear cells. With, with myeloma, maybe only 5 to 10 percent of the bone marrow cells are, are, are myeloma uh, cells, so we have to do a selection for CD138 positive cells and then do the drug sensitivity testing and the, the exome and RNA sequencing. But there are many patients and the, therefore many samples. And this is a heat map now of the drug sensitivity profiles for several patients, and here are our healthy controls. And so, uh, based on, on this analysis, this, this first analysis of 50 patient samples, we can start comparing patients uh, based on their drug sensitivity, and at the same time, we can compare the drugs uh, also. So, with this type of analysis, you can compare the relationship of patients uh, based on their drug response profile, and you also can, can uh, compare the, the the relationship of the drugs. So drugs that have a similar target profile will cluster together. Patients that have a similar drug response profile will also cluster together. And we can make, therefore, you know, from this analysis, five different, actually four different groups of, of patients, one that was very sensitive to many of the inhibitors in our assay, and also another group that starts losing sensitivity to, to rapalogs down here, and then another group that is becoming more resistant, uh, losing sensitivity to HP, HSP90 inhibitors, also CDK9 uh, inhibitors. And then another group here, which is quite resistant, and the only thing that this group was sensitive to was mainly BCL2 inhibitors. But you can see with BCL2 inhibitors that many of the samples were, were, were quite sensitive to this group of drugs. And uh, just comparing this to uh, standard risk markers for, for uh, myeloma, 
We were looking to see if any of these standard cytogenetic markers uh, would be an indicator for, for this type of clustering. Uh, we could see that patients that had a more resistant profiles tended to have a very high risk marker, which is uh, DEL 17P. Uh, this uh, includes the loss of one copy of chromosome 17 and therefore a loss of, of P53. And uh, also another high risk marker, 4, 4, translocation 414. This sort of spread more to the, to the more resistant groups as well. But otherwise, it was very difficult to, I think, say that there was a direct relationship between the standard uh, myeloma cytogenetic markers and, and our, our drug, uh, our chemosensitivity, chemosensitivity groups. But then comparing uh, this uh, functional output to the registry data, so the survival information, treatment information with, for these patients, uh, what we could see is that that one group that showed very good sensitivity to, to several targeted drugs, actually they had very, many of them had very poor uh, progression-free survival, as well as that, that group that had the, the very resistant profile. And uh, if we looked at overall survival of these patients, we can also see that, that uh, group one with a very nice chemosensitivity also had very poor uh, uh, overall survival, as well as that resistant group. And then if we're, we were very interested in, in looking for, for novel treatments for high-risk patients. Uh, one um, sort of high-risk, intermediate-risk marker is uh, the translocation between chromosome 4 and 14, involves uh, two different genes, FGFR3, also MM set, which become overexpressed after they're translocated near the immunoglobulin regulatory region. And we could see from our RNA-seq data that expression is quite high in, in these patients. Uh, this is indicated in purple. These are, are different patient samples, and this is the gene expression level. So both FGFR3 and MM set are highly expressed, and, and so that gave us confidence that we were analyzing the right samples as, as well. But if we looked at the drug response profile for FGFR inhibitors, very, very poor responses. So to, uh, it didn't, so this, what this is indicating is that, that gene expression profiles are not necessarily indicators for drug response. And, and in this case for FGFR, it doesn't seem that FGFR3 is, may, is a really strong driver for, for T414 uh, myeloma patients. But if we look at uh, other drugs uh, that 414 patients are sensitive to, and to the, these top bar plots are um, the SDS uh, values for, for the drugs that were tested. We can see that uh, for 414 patients, actually pomalidomide was one of the best drugs for this group of patients. There was another drug, uh, GSKJ4, uh, which is just mainly a chemical probe, but it targets uh, the uh, enzyme that's encoded by MM set. So we can see in red here uh, drugs that are already approved. Uh, they might be approved for other indications, but seem to be uh, very effective for 414 patients. For patients with DEL17P, there were actually not that many drugs uh, that were uh, selectively effective for this group of patients. They were quite resistant, and, and this is also true in vivo. But if we looked at the, the, the overall drug, so overall drug responses, we could see that there are actually many uh, drugs available. They might uh, have off-target effects, but they are effective and they are approved and could possibly be repositioned for these patients. And then look quickly looking at the in vivo uh, sensitivity, so two patients with 414 uh, were treated with pomalidomide based on, on the drug sensitivity results. And uh, what we could see, and this was, this was also done because uh, pomalidomide, I think, and it's similar in Ireland, it is, well, it's approved, but it, it's not reimbursed. So this was uh, a, a drug that was available, but they were questioning in the, in the clinic whether um, there would be a, a response uh, and, and uh, should they, they use this even 
and should the hospital pay for this cost, the cost of this drug. So these patients were relapsing. We did the drug sensitivity analysis. We showed the good sensitivity to pomalidomide. Actually, there was very poor sensitivity to dexamethasone, but they were given POMDEX in combination and have since been uh, on in, uh, had a partial response for, for about a year now and been maintained on pomalidomide. There was another patient, myeloma patient, with a 1114 translocation. Uh, this particular patient actually showed very good sensitivity to three different uh, mTOR inhibitors. And the patient was given a combination of, of bortezomib and uh, uh, temsorolimus. And there was a, a very good response as well. Uh, the patient relapsed uh, after several months. And when we retested that sample, there was uh, increased resistance uh, to temsorolimus. And if we looked at the mutation data from the pre and post temsorolimus treated samples, it wasn't very black and white. What was, what was the cause behind the, the resistance? And, and there was no really loss of, of one mutation or the other. Uh, what happened was that there was a, just a change in the, the frequency of these mutations. So the, the clone size changed. And what we could see was that uh, a clone that was bearing a mutation to NRAS, uh, REL, uh, ASXL3, uh, and so forth, this was enriched uh, by the temsorolimus and, and bortezomib treatment, while this uh, clone that was bearing a mutation to CYLD was actually uh, reduced by that treatment. And we have since done the exome sequence analysis and, and RNA sequence analysis of, of our cohort. Uh, we can see uh, which genes are, are now being affected in, in both newly diagnosed and, and relapsed refractory patients. And you can see from, from this list, you know, the, the pathways, the signaling pathways that, that are, are being hit in this disease. And I think there are now several publications, especially with newly diagnosed myeloma patients and, and the, the common recurrent uh, mutations in myeloma. When we compare newly mutations present in newly diagnosed myeloma compared to, to relapsed uh, refractory myeloma patients, we can see that actually there's newly diagnosed patients present, often present with RAS mutations or NF-kappa-B mutations, also uh, maybe uh, genes that are involved in splicing, so DNA and RNA processing. But patients that, that are relapsed or refractory, so these patients that have already been treated often have mutations to PI3 kinase or mTOR pathway, also to DNA repair. So we can start seeing that, well, even though the, the patients in, in Finland, the standard of care is usually bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, uh, and, and also alkylating drugs, we can see that with the relapsed patients, there, there are uh, mutant clones that bearing, for example, RAS mutations that, that are always going to remain, and, and these are, are going to cause the relapse. And the current uh, treatments are, are actually not that successful in targeting uh, these mutant clones. So uh, just to, to quickly summarize then, um, are we getting meaningful results with this type of approach, so a system-wide approach uh, to individual uh, patients? And I think I've shown some uh, examples now uh, with BCR able positive uh, or mutant CML and ALL, also with uh, our TCF3 PBX1 positive uh, ALL patient uh, possibility to reposition idealisib uh, uh, to that group of patients. And then uh, from a more uh, wider uh, study uh, with more patients uh, and uh, using especially the ex vivo drug testing assay to, to dis decide on, on treatment that really 40% of the patients, uh, AML patients that have been treated based on that, the results of that assay have responded favorably uh, to their treatment. And then uh, on the basic research side, our, our, our are we getting a better understanding? And I think uh, from the fun applying the functional approach plus the, the molecular profiling uh, exome RNA okay. sequencing, we're getting a much better understanding of uh, the disease progression and drug-resistant mechanisms. And then also, you know, on, on the clinical side, you know, 
Is this beneficial? I think we're generating several new ideas for future uh, trials. At the same time, uh, I think the, the hematology clinic in, in, in Helsinki and also in, in Finland in general, they are uh, now being approached uh, more frequently for running phase one and phase two studies. Uh, this is not just due to this sort of ex vivo you know, and, and sequence approach, but also because of the capability to, to get good samples from these patients and have a, a collection that can be referred back to uh, during the study uh, for, um, for analysis also by the, the pharma companies that are supporting these studies. And then, uh, yes, can we, can we do precision medicine? And, and I think we've only been able to do that in Finland and, and really in a collaborative effort and being able to, to pool our resources, also pool our, our data and, and share and, and communicate uh, between the lab and, and the clinic more frequently. Um, a lot of now of the younger uh, uh, MDs are, are starting to get training on the basic research side, but at the same time as PhDs, we're getting a lot more training and better understanding of, of what's going on in the clinic and how the patients are, are treated. And, and this has wor worked quite well for us in, in Finland. This was really started uh, by, um, I guess, five different research groups uh, at both FIM and, and also our hematology clinic. But uh, basically, we came in with different expertise. Uh, so a couple of us had more omic expertise and also functional uh, drug testing expertise, and then also very good computational expertise. And then a very good collaboration, uh, not only with the, the local hospital in Helsinki, but uh, across the nation as well. Um, so the results are fed back to the different clinics. Uh, we get especially relapsed AML samples and relapsed myeloma <laughs> patient samples across the country. And then also with the setup of the biobank with the Finnish Red Cross blood service. But then I think most importantly, the, the patients as well. I think in, in Finland, they've really been quite brave. Myeloma patients are, are really brave because you need quite a lot of uh, bone marrow to do the drug testing assay. So. They, they've really been great in participating in this, even though they, they are told that the data will not necessarily, uh, results will not necessarily uh, be of use for them. They know in the long term it might help future patients. And then also uh, various funders, as I said, we, we do work collaboratively. We, we pool our funding from, from different national and international sources, also with bio, working with different biotech companies as, as well as, as pharma companies. So thank you very much. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed what, with, with what you have here as well. And, and I, I look forward to seeing the results that, that come from your collaborative efforts as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Caroline. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, that's absolutely wonderful uh, presentation of uh, what's been, I know, an enormous amount of work, and it really is very exciting to see that you've already done it in terms of showing that precision medicine initiatives, modeling of drug resistance, using these very well constructed biobank structures with all of the groups coming together is something that many of us want to aspire to and clearly collaboration is a theme you've emphasized. We, um, we have time for some questions or comments for Professor Eggman. Jim. It's been amazing. So, yeah, uh, we can talk later about the myeloma patients and, and how brave they are. But, but, but it's been very, very impressive. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Any other? Uh, sorry. Maybe. Thanks, Caroline. My question would be about the sequencing. Uh, do you think that if you increase the depth of sequencing, I know it's very, very expensive. Would it give more meaningful results, like identification of 
rare clones. No, de definitely, and, and uh, we're, you know, I think the, the companies that are developing the sequencing technologies, they're, they're coming up with more targeted profiles, so there's like a, a myeloid uh, panel or a lymphoid panel that can be used to do really deep sequencing. I think at, at the moment it's probably not affordable to do that with exome sequencing, but, but definitely with panel sequencing. With panel sequencing, you have the advantage that you don't need that germline control as well. Mike. Sorry, Dan. Uh, Michael. Sorry. Um, I have, I guess, a couple of, of, of questions. Um, one relates to the, you know, assessing the important role of the tumor microenvironment, and I know that you are sort of planning on. On, on doing that, have you established a, a setup where you can take into account the, you know, the role that survival that the non-tumor cells may, may, may play? Yes, so we have actually been working very actively for, with the high throughput flow based analysis where for myeloma or AML, we can assess the impact of the drugs not only on the myeloma or AML cell, but also on, on the other cell types. Uh, with um, myeloma in that setup, we do use this conditioned media from, from a stromal, bone marrow stromal cell line uh, to maintain the viability of the myeloma cell. So it is, it is, very, it is very important. We, don't, uh, we haven't quite set up, say, um, co-cultural assays, and I think you're doing that, that here, but uh, that would probably be in the future as well. And, and the, other, the other question is whether there is the possibility with your high throughput setup to look at, at changes within the sort of immune uh, microenvironment, if yeah. you like, the immune um, subpopulations. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we're also investigating with the, the high throughput flow. So, looking at the, the different lymphocyte populations, for example. Can we just we have one more question, please? Well, it was it was a very impressive talk and a very impressive operation. Uh, can you give us a, just a, a better understanding of what does it take? So how many like people are full time working on, on a clinical side or on a genomic side uh, that, that, to make it work? Yes, yet. Well, having very interested core services. So the high throughput unit was you know, sort of new when we were getting started. They were very enthusiastic. And I, I think what every everybody was very enthusiastic on was that they got to work with real patient samples. They weren't working on cell lines or you know, mouse cells or something, but they were actually working on patient samples. And so this created a sort of atmosphere of enthusiasm and, and, and better support. So, and uh, yeah, just feeling that the work that they were doing would have possibly uh, an impact on patient care. I think it really um, helped that move that collaboration and motivation. So, but basically we, we do have a, you know, we have one group actually, my group is the one that mainly does uh, some, we have the biobank facilities at the Red Cross Blood Service, but when we do the drug testing and the other omic analysis, we get a parallel sample with the biobank sample because we can't wait for the biobank sample to do the drug testing. So we have actually two different permissions in place when we want to do that, uh, the drug testing and, and the sequence analysis. So part of the patient sample goes off to the biobank, the other comes directly to, to us at FIM so we can process that and do the drug testing and the sequence analysis in a very short amount of time. So we, do the, we have workflows for the processing and then the sequencing lab has a uh, an expedited workflow for, for sequencing. We call it the fast track sequencing service. There's a little bit of an extra charge, but the, there are a couple technicians that will drop everything that they're doing and start working on the sequence analysis for that. And then the high throughput unit also has their workflow for expedited service as well. So, uh, yeah, that's how we got it to, to, to work. So, just a bit of motivation and enthusiasm and, and just wanting to, and altruism as well. On, on, on the basic research side. Well, again, that's fantastic here, Caroline. Thank you very much again for, for a wonderful presentation.